Michael R. Williamson lecturing on the ultrasound detection of hernias. I'm from the University of New Mexico. I have no relevant financial relationships. And let's first talk about the anatomy of the inguinal region. Most of our talk is going to focus on the inguinal area, and we'll talk a little bit about the uh, um umbilicus and umbilical hernias. The inguinal canal is where our problems are centered, and we have a deep ring, as indicated by my arrow, and a more superficial ring, uh, as indicated by the arrow here. Uh, this is rectus abdominis, and this is the inferior epigastric artery that is labeled here. This is an important anatomic landmark that we will use to uh, identify the important areas uh, where hernias occur. Femoral artery and vein are also important in my technique of identifying these hernias. And finally, we have the inguinal ligament, which uh, extends down along the inguinal canal and is a good marker, but is difficult to see. This is the testicle sliding down the inguinal canal. The testicle descends embryologically while you are in, uter in utero. Uh, that canal then becomes a potential pathway for an inguinal hernia. The inguinal hernia that occurs through the inguinal canal is an indirect hernia. It's called indirect because when the surgeon would open the groin, this hernia would come into his field of view indirectly from above. This type of hernia goes from the anterior inferior iliac spine towards the pubic symphysis, and if the hernia is bad enough, it goes into the groin or into the scrotum. This is looking from the side, and this is the testicle cutting through the various fascial layers and the muscular layers of the abdominal wall. It goes from in the abdominal cavity to out of the abdominal cavity. Presumably, the purpose of that is to keep the testicle cooler so that sperm can be made. But this is a pathway, and once again, this is the, this is the location of a potential hernia. We're going to make it go one more time here. There we go. Looking from the side, your uh, layers of the anterior abdominal wall are up here. The muscular layers are here. And then this is the abdominal cavity back here. So in my technique for identifying an, uh, an inguinal hernia, I start with the femoral artery and vein. At approximately the level where the saphenous vein comes in, I'm transverse to these vessels uh, where we have number one labeled here. We look in this area, we have the patient Valsalva, and we look for a femoral hernia to come down into the thigh. We then slide our transducer up the femoral artery and vein. We attempt to identify the inferior epigastric artery, and we look again, looking for that hernia that is an indirect sliding from the anterior inferior iliac spine down toward the pubic symphysis and ultimately into the scrotum if it goes far enough. Slider transducer medially, and this is direct hernia territory where number three is. A direct hernia uh, pokes through the walls of the abdominal cavity and uh, pokes straight at the transducer. So instead of coming obliquely like the indirect hernia, it will come directly at you. And uh, I will show you some examples of that in a minute. And finally, the fourth type of hernia that we will look for is up here where number four is uh, on the slide. This is at the linea semilunaris, the junction between rectus abdominis muscle and in the oblique musculature. It's along the course of the inferior epigastric artery and where the inferior epigastric artery penetrates the fascial planes. Uh, and it pokes towards the transducer, just like a direct hernia. So what's the terminology? Well, the neck of a hernia is the narrow part. That's usually where the defect is located, and that's usually where the hernia sac gets constricted. It's a good idea to give the neck size in your report. The sac or body is the main part of the hernia. That's the peritoneal balloon or peritoneal sac that contains the hernia. Give a size of this sac and describe the contents. Is it fat containing or does it contain bowel? A strangulated hernia means that the uh, contents of the hernia sac are ischemic. You, you really can't tell this with ultrasound reliably. Uh, 
an incarcerated hernia means that the hernia cannot be reduced uh, and that the contents of the hernia sac, either bowel or fat, are just locked in place. Hernias are best described as reducible or non-reducible. Reducible means that it can be reduced, obviously, and non-reducible means that it's incarcerated. Incarcerated does not necessarily mean that it is ischemic. So the quick version, how do you do this? Start with the femoral artery and vein, about where the saphenous comes in, move from superior to inferior, look for a femoral hernia which will poke down next to the femoral vein. This is more common in females and strangulates. Look for an indirect hernia from the anterior inferior iliac spine going toward the pubic symphysis. It's a congenital hernia caused by a loose ring, a, a big inguinal canal, it's seen mostly in males, and, it, and the hernia sac is anterior to the cord. These tend to strangulate. A direct hernia is medial to the inferior epigastric artery and is behind, comes from behind the cord. It moves posterior to anterior. It occurs in old males, sometimes called an old man's hernia. These don't strangulate often. You can live with these for years. They're not, uh, not a very important type of hernia but they will get bigger over time. A spagellian hernia moves posterior to anterior at the linea semilunaris, occurs anywhere along that line, usually don't strangulate. Umbilical hernias, mostly in females associated with pregnancy, may strangulate and may not be exactly in the umbilicus Oftentimes in adults, these are para-umbilical hernias, whereas in children, they are directly in the umbilicus. So let's look at the layers of the abdominal wall. We have external oblique muscle, internal oblique muscle. We have transverse abdominus muscle, transversalis fascia, and peritoneum. There are a few other layers that surgeons like to talk about, but we generally can't pick these out very well. They're, most, they're mostly fat. These are the important layers that we're interested in. What are the causes and associations of hernias? Well, the indirect hernia has a congenital component. Uh, it is caused by a big inguinal canal. They occur more often on the right. The right testicle descends last. And uh, you see probably 80% of them in the right groin and maybe 20% in the left groin. All hernias are associated with a collagen abnormality. There's an abnormal ratio of type 3 immature collagen to type 1 mature collagen. There's an association with aortic aneurysms that has been known for a long time. Other associations include cigarette smoking, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, mucopolysaccharidosis, obesity, poor conditioning, ascites, peritoneal dialysis, COPD, and probably a bunch of other things. This, so this association with cigarette smoking uh, is not quite 100%, but I, go, I ask patients if they're smokers when I go in the room, and uh, the large majority of them are. The femoral hernias in the upper thigh are associated with pregnancy, and the more pregnancies a woman has, the more common the hernia, or the more likely the hernia. The femoral hernia occurs through the femoral ring, which is the entrance to the femoral canal, this accounts for about 20% of hernias in females, but only a small number in males. It's usually just above the saphenous merger with the femoral vein and medial to the vein. There's a risk of strangulation. This can extend into the medial thigh. It can be actually be quite large and cause a huge bulge in the medial thigh and reach almost to the knee. It contains fat and or bowel. So this is a depiction of the location of a femoral hernia. This is the saphenous vein coming in. Here's the hernia sac. In this location, it will come down the thigh alongside the vein. So here is a cine of a femoral hernia. Here's the femoral vein. Here's the femoral artery. This is muscle. Watch where the two arrows are as the patient performs a valsalva maneuver. The patient pushes, and here we have a little bit of fat poking down into the femoral canal. This will become larger over time, probably ought to be repaired. If it's not going to be repaired now, then it probably will need to be repaired in the future. This is another one. Thermal vein is this arrow back here. 
And this is the hernia sac poking down into the thigh as the patient performs a valsalva maneuver. This is a little bigger hernia, fat containing only. I don't think there's any bowel in there. So an indirect hernia. So the indirect hernia enters the deep ring, which is marked by the inferior epigastric artery. You need to try to find the inferior epigastric artery. This extends from the peritoneal cavity into the deep ring down the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal in a female is called the canal of nook. Uh, I use the term inguinal canal for both sexes, but in reality the, the correct anatomic term is canal of nook. These are often congenital because of a patent canal. In a male, the testicle has descended, as I showed you earlier. In a female, it's just a canal and a potential pathway. Uh, I don't see very many of these in females. These are usually on the right more than the left. They contain fat and or bowel. The neck is frequently at the deep ring. And this whole hernia sac lies anterior to the spermatic cord if you're able to identify the cord. So here is the location for an indirect hernia. The purple, uh, purple sac here is the hernia sac. It's coming down the canal. The brown shows you the inguinal canal. And uh, this would be the superficial ring at this location. The green is the spermatic cord. And these, can go, come, these can go into this canal just a little bit, or they can come way down to the scrotum. This is an example of one. That the transducer is parallel to the inguinal canal and the inguinal ligament, and this is fat poking down into the, uh, into the inguinal canal. There's fluid in the canal. If you see fluid in the canal, you should be very suspicious that there is, a, is an indirect hernia. This is a very small hernia where the fat is protruding just slightly into the canal. You can't really see uh, the inferior epigastric artery back here. The internal iliac arteries and artery and vein are all the way back here. But this person, should this be repaired? Uh, if this were me, I probably would not have it repaired, if, at least until it got worse. This is a static image of uh, an indirect hernia with the cursors marking the neck, and the hernia sac is coming down like this. So when I was preparing this talk, or when Sherry Tiffey asked me if I would give this talk, she asked me if I would also talk about her way of looking for these hernias, and I'm going to call this the Tiffey technique. I think it's a good technique. I've just been using it for maybe the last six months. Uh, and it's a, it's a technique to find the location of the deep ring, because a lot of times you can't find that inferior epigastric artery. Many patients it's prominent, and many patients it's almost uh, invisible. So the way I the way I do this, if I'm going to do the T feet technique, is I start down next to the penis, lateral to it, near the pubic symphysis, follow the cord superior and lateral, and basically you're following the inguinal canal. When you uh, go up the inguinal canal to the point where it crosses the femoral artery and vein, you are now at the expected location of the deep ring and the inferior epigastric artery. This will allow you to identify an indirect hernia and allow you to go from there and look for a direct hernia. I think this may be easier than, than looking for the inferior epigastric artery in many patients. I haven't completely converted to this technique, but uh, I think it's pretty good. We have two CT slices uh, of showing the spermatic cord uh, where my arrow is on the left and where my arrow is on the right. Here's another slice, arrow on the right and arrow on the left. You find that cord at the pubic symphysis and it looks like these linear striations right here on this uh, ultrasound image and right here on this ultrasound image. You look here, you have the patient Valsalva and that will help you locate the indirect hernia. So that is an alternative way to identify the location of the deep ring. A direct hernia is an old, also known as an old man's hernia. There's poor coverage of the conjoined tendon. The conjoined tendon is from internal oblique musculature, transversus abdominis muscle. 
and transversus abdominis aponeurosis. It's probably more often a tear in the transversalis fascia, and it's usually, there's usually a wide, broad neck. It's reducible, doesn't tend to strangulate or incarcerate, and uh, will get bigger if it's not repaired, but it's the most common type of hernia I see, even though large series indicate an indirect hernia is more common. But when you exclude children, a direct hernia is more common. And so this is the territory where a direct hernia occurs. Uh, it pokes straight out at the transducer. I'll show you an example. Uh, indirect hernias are anterior to the cord. This is a transverse shot of the spermatic cord, and direct hernias come from behind the cord, come from way back in the back because they're penetrating through all the fascial layers. This is a lateral shot of the layers of the abdominal wall showing how the transversalis fascia has been penetrated by this hernia sac and causes a bulge here. The uh, uh, internal oblique and external oblique musculature are still intact. The transversus abdominis musculature, the dark, which is the dark brown, is still intact. But ultimately, this will get bigger and will penetrate through more muscular layers. So here's one. Patient Valsalvas, and it pokes right directly toward the transducer. And another one. This one does not reduce completely. It mostly goes back into the abdominal cavity, but does not completely reduce. And a third one. A Spigelian hernia, as I indicated earlier, defect in the aponeurosis of the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis, anywhere along the linas, linear semilunaris. It's usually in the lower abdomen where the inferior epigastric artery penetrates and where the rectus abdominis musculature is less broad. It is another one that goes posterior to anterior, just like a direct hernia. I, I think of these as almost like a direct hernia. And so a Spigelian hernia occur, occurs a little higher. Direct hernia is down in here, in Hasselbeck's triangle, but Spigelian hernia a little higher. Umbilical hernias at the umbilical ring increase in size with age. Another one that moves posterior to anterior. Uh, maybe they occur because the round ligament, the obliterated umbilical vein, doesn't reinforce the umbilical ring, or maybe it's late mid-gut return to the abdomen, leaving a, a defect at the uh, umbilicus. Most adults actually have a paraumbilical hernia uh, due to a weak linea alba, but uh, it doesn't make any difference. You look around the umbilicus, the patient can usually point to where symptoms are or where a bulge occurs, and you look in that area. You need to repair umbilical hernias. They tend to strangulate. Here's an example of one. You can see that the neck where the arrows are is smaller than the sac, which is up in here. And this is a fat containing. I don't really see bowel in this hernia sac. Here's a narrow sac. You can see why this doesn't reduce. This one uh, is at risk of uh, strangulating. So what are the steps? Take your transducer, transver transverse to the femoral artery and vein. Find the saphenous vein entrance into the femoral vein. Look for a femoral hernia. Move along the femoral artery and vein superiorly. Look for superficial and deep iliac circumflex arteries. These arteries deviate laterally. The next vessel, as you go up, goes medially, and that's the inferior epigastric artery. Rotate your transducer along the plane of the inguinal canal. Look for an indirect hernia. Move the transducer medially. Look for a direct hernia. Move the transducer superiorly. Look for a spigelian hernia. Stand the patient up and do it all again. So here are the vessels that I was just talking about. Superficial iliac artery comes off the femoral and goes laterally. Deep, deep circumflex iliac artery comes off the femoral artery and goes laterally. Next artery up is the inferior epigastric artery. If you keep following this femoral artery superiorly, the artery will go deep into the pelvis and start to, start to disappear. It'll, it'll get further away from the transducer. When this artery has gone deep and you can't see it well anymore, you've gone too far up and you've missed the inferior epigastric artery. 
This is the problem that these are sometimes hard to see. The patient will often have a big paniculus, it'll be hanging down, they'll be obese, and that will limit your ability to see them. Do them supine, it's easier to find the anatomic landmarks with the patient supine, and then stand the patient up, and do it all again with the patient standing. Most of these patients are poorly conditioned, they can't generate very much intra-abdominal pressure in, until you stand them up. So you've got a better chance of finding the, the hernia with them standing, but a better chance of finding your landmarks with them supine. Here we go again. Over and over again, we're going to keep talking about this. Number one, look for a femoral hernia. Down in the upper thigh, about where the saphenous vein comes in. Go up the femoral artery and vein and look for an indirect hernia at the location of the deep ring marked by the inferior epigastric artery. Slide medially and uh, look for a direct hernia and come up and look for a spagellian hernia. I do these only on one side. I only do them on the symptomatic side. Uh, if I find a hernia, I may go to the other side. The, the surgeons will repair both sides simultaneously if I find them on both sides. Stand them up. Don't do them supine only. I go into the room all the time to scan these. We require that a physician scan these patients. And I'll say to the sonographer or the resident, did you stand them up? Well, no, I didn't stand them up. You've got to stand them up or you're going to miss hernias. What about the complications of a hernia repair? Well, mostly in the United States, mesh is placed to repair the hernia. So you need to look for a recurrent hernia along the edge of the mesh and scan the periphery of the mesh. You also need to worry about infection. Uh, infection will be indicated by fluid. Fluid is normal post-op for a month or so. The spermatic cord is thick post-op, and that does not mean infection. And then you need to worry about testicular ischemia. Patient comes in with pain, I always look at the testicle to see if it looks like ischemic. It will, if it is ischemic, it will be heterogeneous in appearance, may be small. Brief notes on the surgical repair. These are the complications from an open hernia repair. About a 19% complication rate. Many of these are just standard post-op complications. Uh, laparoscopic repair has a slightly uh, increased incidence of complications, but uh, most of these resolve on their own and are not important. But notice that this orchitis, which can come from uh, compromise of the testicular artery, occurs in about 1% of patients, and that's about the number I see. I see uh, three or four of these uh, testicular compromise cases per year. Uh, architis probably occurs because of thrombosis of the veins, the pampiniform plexus, not because of compromise of the testicular artery in most patients. It leads to, this leads to venous congestion of the testicle, usually occurs two to five days post-op, and may go on for six to 12 weeks before the testicle finally atrophies and becomes non-functional. This can also occur secondary to ligation of the testicular artery, but that is uh, less common than just compromise of the ve venous drainage. Probably occurs because mesh is placed in a too tight a fashion. In, a, in the traditional repair without mesh, the repair may be too tight, but the patient will move around and will actually stretch that repair out on his own in general, and so compromise is probably a little less common. This is a testicle in a young man, a 21-year-old man. You can see how heterogeneous the testicle is, and there's not much flow in it. Uh, we're trying to do pulse Doppler and getting essentially nothing. Uh, this testicle atrophied and died. Interestingly enough, the patient didn't care. Um, found that kind of be an odd response, but um, the hernia repair was successful. I guess it was very tight, a very tight, firm hernia repair. This is a patient, uh, a pre-op set of images of the right testicle. The left testicle looks similar. And here is the left testicle. After the repair, he has developed varicosities around the testicle. That indicates to me that the, that repair is too tight. 
this patient continued to have pain for about three months and then uh, was lost to follow up. I do not know what the final outcome was, whether the, whether the testicle died or whether uh, he's just left with a varicose seal. Nerve injuries and pain, traction can cause injury to nerves, electrocautery, transection, entrapment, and the mesh may lead to dysesthesias, which are usually temporary. Nerves at risk are these. I'm not going to go into these. At one point, I learned these. I remembered these for about 24 hours. Uh, I don't think it's important that you know these. They, several of them come out as depicted here in this Netter diagram out the inguinal canal. In general, uh, and I have listed the nerves here and the symptoms you get from them, in general, you'll have some numbness or dysesthesias associated with the nerves just depending on which nerve it is. You don't need to know which nerve it is, but you need to know that if they have complaints of numbness or pain, that there's likely compromise of a nerve. And there's not very much to do about it, frankly. Uh, there's also a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, uh, which uh, gets the skin of the lateral thigh a little bit removed from your usual surgical site and inguinal region. Transient neuralgias usually resolve. Persistent neuralgias and pain and hyperesthesias may be relieved by hyperextension of the hip. I'm sorry, increased by hyperextension of the hip and relieved by flexion. That's a good indication that your mesh is too tight. Transection leads to numbness. Uh, it can do a repair, but it's, it's going to be tough. So systematic follow-up, large series. Uh, pain is the most common complication, and it usually goes away. The significance of pain for ultrasound really just comes down to are they infected and do they have a recurrent hernia? Has the repair been successful? Recurrent hernia with mesh. Try to find the edges of the mesh and work your way around the mesh, including the top and the bottom. See if, the, if tissue protrudes through where you, where you believe the center of the mesh is. The mesh, more often than failing in the center, will just collapse, migrate, and kind of act like a wadded up piece of tissue paper. It will become displaced. A few facts on mesh. There are two main types. There's polypropylene, um, brand names are Marlex, Proline, Sergiline, about a half a millimeter thick. There's expanded polypropylene, Gore-Tex, Micromesh, which is about a millimeter thick, both of these are porous and get tissue ingrowth. They, they can be seen as hyperechoic lines, but here's the problem. They're hard to see, and as time goes by, they become harder, I think, because of tissue ingrowth into the mesh. Ultrapro and Vicro are resorbable or partially resorbable. These definitely become harder to see over time. We don't use these currently at my institution. Uh, if, if you have rapport with your surgeons, it's good to ask them what they use. You can go into the operative note and look, and you probably won't find out. I, in general, don't find the surgeons listing what they have placed in the patient. This is a failure of mesh. The mesh was way back here, and this uh, hernia with bowel has protruded into the inguinal region. Um, not much to do about it. This is another failed mesh. Uh, the mesh is, get my arrow up, the mesh is here and there, and uh, uh, it's hard to know if the mesh has just become de detached or exactly what's happened to it. Without mesh, do the exam just like you would if the patient had never had a hernia repair. For infection, look for edema or fluid at the surgical scar. Try to find the mesh and look for associated fluid. Look for fluid in the inguinal canal, in the hemiscrotum, space of retzius, retrovesical space. Look all around the pelvis, see if there's fluid. If there's deep infection around the mesh, if there's fluid around the mesh, the mesh is going to have to come out. If it's a superficial infection removed from the mesh, i.e. several centimeters away from the mesh, you probably do not need to remove it. This is a 
was a VIP at my institution, a prominent member of the athletic department. Uh, he had this hernia repair with this post-op fluid collection and pain. Uh, it didn't look like he was infected when I looked at him. He uh, was supposed to come back and see me at six months, and uh, I was going to aspirate this if it persisted. He did not reappear. I looked in his medical record, and he wasn't complaining about any symptoms any longer. So I don't think anything happened to him. I, know, I don't believe any intervention was done. References to read about these and try to get better at them. Uh, Dynamic Ultrasound of the Hernias by Stavros and Rapp. This is really a great article. I, uh, I had a lot of aha moments when I was reading this article. Another article is one that I wrote with one of our residents, Burleson and Williamson, Ultrasonography of Hernias, hernias in the Ultrasound Clinics of North America in 2014. There are cines associated with this if you want to look at them. And that is hernias. Thank you very much.